was unbound. I was unbound. I, couldn't, I didn't just have to, to walk everywhere, but I was able to, to ride my bike wherever I wanted. And we had financial freedom. My friends and I, we had financial freedom. We were starting to get an allowance. And then we were able to do whatever we wanted with that money. And so how did my friends and I in the summer of 1987 leverage all of this newfound freedom that we had? We rode our bikes to 7-Eleven every single day, and we bought the biggest Slurpees that we could possibly get, and we collected, at this time, this is the latest and greatest in technology in 1987, there were these little holographic baseball cards at the bottom of the Slurpee cups, and we would, we would take them off, and we would, we would collect them, and we would trade them, and life was, life was great. We leveraged all of the freedom that we had in that glorious summer of 1987 to go to 7-Eleven. That's, that's what we did with our freedom. Um, our, our nation, our country values freedom. It is, it is a high, if not the highest value in our country. And that is a good thing. That is a good thing that, that we value freedom because human flourishing really is best under the, the umbrella of freedom. But as followers of Jesus Christ, we are, we are dual citizens. We are citizens first of the, the kingdom of heaven and then citizens of, of whatever nation we live in. And so we ask, we ask some different questions. We ask some different questions and we view things through a different lens than those who, who don't yet know Jesus Christ. And the question that we ask is, what do we leverage our freedoms for? What do we leverage our freedoms for? Not simply what are, what are we free from, but what do we leverage our freedoms for? How do we, how do we use the freedoms that we have to the best of what they can be. We are certainly uh, free. We are free from uh, the bondage of sin and of the death, of death and of Satan. But we, we view this freedom in uh, a little bit of a different way. We view this freedom as a gift that is given, not simply a right that we have. We view the freedom that we have as followers of Jesus Christ not simply as a right that we have, but a gift that has been given to us. A gift that's been given to us. Uh, Paul writes this in Galatians chapter 5. And we're going to see this theme that Paul writes about to different churches. So he's writing of the church in Galatia here. And in Galatians, Galatians 5, he says, For you are called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. You see, when we see our freedom as a gift that's been given to us, we're able to use it differently. When we see the freedom that we have as a gift that's been given to us, we're able to use it differently. And we use it not simply to indulge our selfish desires and indulge the flesh, as Paul writes in Galatians, but instead we, we leverage those gifts to love and to serve others. And that's a radical way to use freedom, not for our own selfish desires, not to, to get what we want or to get more of what we want and to uh, attain and gather and collect more, but in order to, to love and serve others. So if we, have, if we have freedom of speech, then we leverage our speech, we leverage that, that freedom that we have in order to speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, in order to speak for those who have been silenced. We leverage the freedoms that we have to, to love and to serve others around us. That's a, that's a radical difference. That's a radical way of, of looking at freedom that you have. You have the, the right to use that freedom any way that you want. But will you use that freedom to indulge yourself, to indulge what you desire, to indulge what you want? Or, were you, or will you leverage that freedom and see that gift that you've been given that has been freely given to you? Will you freely give that gift and leverage that gift and use it for others? That's one of the questions that we as, as Christian citizens, that's one of the questions that we ask. Because here's the reality, that when freedom is only used for selfish gain, when freedom is only used to indulge what the individual wants, and there's no idea that, that what we have and what we've been given is not only for ourselves, but it's also for others and it's for the greater good, then in order to, to constrain that, more and more laws have to be put in place. 
When there is no internal motivation to constrain the freedom and restrain the freedom that you have been given, not only for yourself but for the, the greater whole, more and more laws must be, must be given in order to, to bring restraint. And here's the deal. Laws can only tell us what we should and shouldn't do. It cannot inspire us to be exactly who we should be. Laws can only tell us what behaviors to avoid. It cannot inspire us to what we can be. Have you ever seen a law and thought, That's a, that is a beautiful law? Whether you're driving down the street and you see a speed limit, that is a beautiful speed limit. I want to go 25 miles per hour right now. Or when you see a law, does your sinful human nature, and let's be honest here, we're in church, let's be honest, does your sinful human nature immediately look for the loophole? Or what is the, what is the absolute edge of this, of this law that I can push? Maybe without getting caught. What is, what is the loophole that, that I can find in this, in this law, whether it's a tax code or whether it's a speed limit? Our sinful human desire sees laws as something to break, right? Rules are meant to be broken. That's the old adage, right? So laws cannot be, laws are not given to inspire us. They only show us what behaviors to avoid. And so as as followers of Jesus Christ, we use the freedom that we've been given, we use the freedom that we've been given and we leverage it to love others, but we also live lives that inspire those around us to see what we can be to see what we are called to be, what we are created to be, what we are made to be in the image of God. So we leverage, we leverage what we have to love others and we live lives that inspire others to see what freedom looks like in Christ. Here's an example of that from the Old Testament in Isaiah. So the people of God, they are, they're given a mission, they're given a, uh, a task, and they fail in this task, and they mess up, and they backslide, but nonetheless, God is is working through them. And so God, Yahweh, is speaking to Isaiah, and he says this, is it too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribe of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel? And then he says this, and he's speaking to Isaiah, but he's speaking to the entire people of God. He says, I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach the end of the earth. Now certainly this is a prophetic message that that God is speaking, and he's saying that the Messiah, the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ, will come through the people of Israel. But even in that moment, in that time, the people of God were to live in such a way that those around them, those, those people around them, even those pagan nations around them would see them, and they would see something wholly different in them. And it wasn't the laws that they observed, but it was the way that they lived their life under the rule and the reign of Yahweh. The freedom that they had been given, not only the freedom that they had been given from bondage in actual real slavery in Egypt, but the freedom that they had been given to live in His love and His grace and His mercy that He showed to them over and over and over again. And when the people of God lived the way that that He designed them to live, the the way that He created them to be, it inspired, it inspired those around them. And it caused them to, to ask, who is this God that you serve? Who is this God that has made you who you are? Because it wasn't, this message wasn't just for them, but it was for, it was for all people. It was for all people around them. So fast forward to the New Testament. Paul, once again, is writing to another church, the church in Corinth. And this is our reading from today. And he says this when he's talking about freedom. He says, for though I am free from all, I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all that I may win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as as one under the law, though not being myself under the law that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became the weak, I became weak, 
I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. And I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. So Paul is notoriously wordy. And Luther basically summarizes what he's writing there in Corinthians in one, one sentence, one equally paradoxical and confusing sentence. But Luther says this, a Christian is, utterly, is an utterly free person, Lord of all, subject to none, utterly free. Next sentence, a Christian is an utterly dutiful person, servant of all, subject to all. What Luther is getting at there is that as followers of Jesus Christ, freedom is not found in indulging our sinful desire. Freedom is not found in doing whatever we find pleasing, whatever we want to do. But true, actual freedom, not the kind of freedom that this world will sell you or that the the enemy Satan will sell you, the messages that that you'll hear over and over again, real, true, life-giving freedom is found in Jesus Christ. It's found in Jesus Christ, and it's, it's in that freedom, the gift that we have been given in Jesus Christ, that we are free, free to truly be human as we were created to be. Not this tarnished version of humanity infected by sin, but truly free to live and to love and to serve The world will tell you that that is not freedom. Freedom is doing whatever you want to do. And I'm telling you, Christian citizen, brothers and sisters, redeemed children of God, that is the definition of slavery. That is sin, doing whatever you want to do. But freedom is found only in one. Freedom is found in Jesus Christ and Him alone. We ask different questions. Not what are we free, not necessarily what are we free from, but what are we free for. So why would you do this? Why would you, why would you live and leverage your freedom to love others? Why would you live in such a way that others could, could see you and could see the way that you live and be inspired by the way that you live? Why would you, why would you take the rights that you have and sacrifice them and forego those rights for the sake of others. Why would you do such a thing? Well, once again, the answer lies in Christ because that is exactly what has been given to you. Jesus Christ, the Lord of all, the King of kings, the one who is bound to none, the one who is the creator of this universe, leveraged all of it for your sake. He came down in flesh and took on our sinfulness He took on the the things that that bind us and and bound us and the things that that enslave us. He took it all on himself and he dragged it with him onto the cross. He buried it with him into the tomb and then he walked out on Easter Sunday completely free. And he says, now that freedom is yours too. That freedom that I won for you is yours. Free. Free. No charge. This isn't a bait and switch. You have been given everything in him. A Christian author who wrote this, the one who hears the gospel of Jesus is free because freedom is not a kind of higher debt, but the condition of life without any law at all. It is being Lord over the law, belonging to and living in Christ himself who cannot be traded, owed, or governed, only given. See, we are free from from having to indulge the sinful desire. We are free from from having to do what our, our selfishness wants to do. We have been set free in Jesus Christ. We no longer have to self justify ourselves. We no longer have to look only for our own benefit. We no longer have to to get what we can because in Christ we are secure. We have been given everything in Him. 
we have been restored in our relationship with Him, and it allows us to be restored in our relationship with others. Not only is our eternity secure, but our present is secure. And so we don't find security in indulging our selfish desire, but we find our security in Christ. And then we leverage the freedoms that we have for the sake of others so that they can know that same grace and that same mercy and that same love and that same life-giving freedom that we have in Him. Tangible example of this uh, came out several years ago with two men, um, one named Jamel McGee, another named uh, Michael Collins. Jamel McGee was arrested and convicted of possession of and selling drugs, and he was given four years in prison. And the whole time that he was in prison, he maintained his innocence, like a lot of people do when they're in prison. But it turns out Jamel McGee was, was actually innocent because the officer um, who arrested him, Michael Collins, he was found guilty of planting and lying, planting evidence and lying about 50 arrests that he made and convictions from his arrests. And so Michael Collins was, was found guilty and he was put in prison. And Jamal McGee spent four years, four years of his 10-year sentence in prison before he was released. Michael Collins served a, a year and a half in prison and then he was released. And afterwards, they, they happened to find themselves working at the same cafe that was helping them restore their lives after prison. And they ran into each other and Jamal McGee saw Michael Collins and he said, you're the man who arrested me. You're the man who planted evidence on me. You're the man who lied about me. You're the man who took away free four years of my life and put me behind bars. And all that Michael Collins could say in that moment was, I'm sorry. And Jamel McGee looked at him, and without hesitation, he said, I forgive you. And in that moment, Michael Collins said it was like a ginormous weight and burden had been lifted off of him. And his only response to those simple words, I forgive you, is to weep. And he said it was so powerful because Jamel McGee had every right, he had every right to, hold, to withhold forgiveness from me and to hold a grudge against me. But instead, he chose, he chose to forgive. Jamal McGee is a follower of Jesus Christ, and in his response to the story, he said, I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe that there is someone greater, and I aim for something higher. And he said, therefore, I forgive. Jamel McGee leveraged his freedom and he set aside and laid aside his right in order to offer forgiveness and life and freedom to Michael Collins, even though he didn't deserve it and even though he wasn't owed that. But Jamel McGee was able to do that because he had been set free. He had been set free by the blood of Jesus Christ, the one who leveraged and gave up everything for him in order for him to, in order for him to empower Jamal McGee to leverage everything that he has to love and forgive others. Followers of Jesus Christ, citizens of the kingdom, you have been set free, but not in the way that this world thinks of, of freedom. You have been set free into Jesus Christ, into His love and His grace and His mercy and His security. You are set free to leverage the freedoms and the rights that you have in this life in order to love and to serve the other around you, knowing that everything is secure in Him. So how will you leverage your, your freedom? How will you leverage the rights that you have to love and to serve others? Let's not go to 7-Eleven and drink Slurpees, although that's pretty fun. But let's love and serve those around us, leveraging the freedom that we've been given, using the rights that we have, 
and laying them aside for the sake of the other. Because that is exactly what you have in Jesus Christ. Amen.